Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. And I just want to know whose rowboat that is outside because it's double parked. <laughs> you guys, thank you for being here today, especially in this storm. It's yours. Okay, good. Because <laughs> because uh, it's it's raining. It's raining here, and we could hear it. We could hear it hitting the the roof. Um, luckily, we have a new roof on, so there there may not be any leaks. So that's what we're hoping for. So. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Have you ever been on a boat in a storm? You know, I, I think I've shared this with you before that my parents were missionaries in Brazil. And, and when we moved to Brazil, South America, we went by boat. In fact, it was a really big boat. It was an ocean liner. And the weather the first day was fantastic. We went exploring everywhere. We swam in the pools. And back then, you know, they actually used the seawater for uh, the pool water. And we had a blast. But for the balance of the trip, the, the seas were stormy. And, and I gotta tell you, even in the swimming pool, I could feel the movement, rocking of the boat back and forth. And I remember feeling afraid and I got very seasick. And for, for there, were, there were many days of that 11 day voyage that I could not keep anything down. I was horribly sick um, and I'm a confirmed landlubber now. But in today's gospel reading for Mark, Jesus has been teaching large crowds of people like he did every day. It was a typical day and he got tired. Um, he was beside the Sea of Galilee and he was teaching them with parables. And we heard about the parable of the mustard seed last week from Reverend Terry. And in today's story, it's nighttime. Jesus has been teaching all day and he's seeking refuge from the crowd. And he suggested to the disciples to cross over to the other side, which by the way was Gentile territory. Not to be confused with genteel. That's a little different. Gentile territory is anything that wasn't Jewish. In fact, in the ancient world, it also had a meaning of being pagan or heathen, but, but I'm digressing. That's another story. So they go across by boat, by boat. And, and after, um, after all, they were fishermen. So they went, uh, most, the majority of them were fishermen anyway. And Jesus falls asleep at the seat of honor where there are some cushions. He's comfortable. He's sound asleep. Which means, of course, that even God incarnate gets tired. Now, how many people here have experiences with fishermen? Now, not sports fishermen, okay? These are, these are professional fishermen that do fishing for a living or perhaps even just to get dinner. My experience 50 years ago in Brazil, the fishermen would go out and bring back their catch and they would bring back a daily catch that they would sell right there on the beach. And then they would take it into the, the restaurants as well. And I, I remember we got some of the best lobster I've ever tasted and they were still alive. And I didn't realize then that we, we actually put them in the boiling water alive, but then I'm digressing again and that's another story. But the fishermen were mostly poor fishermen and this was their means of making a living. Now the boats that they used, this is what was so astounding. The boats that they used were called jangadas. I'm gonna ask Tim to put up a picture of a jangada on, on there. You can see it's basically what it is. It's, it's, it's a raft made of light wood that is bound together with a sail, a seat, a steering oar and dagger boards. And they're used by by these fishermen that went up and down the east coast, east, northeastern coast of Brazil. In fact, this word jangada means joining together of timber. And the, and the boat itself, this is the boat, the bottom, it's flat. You're at sea level when you're standing on it, right? And the water is coming across. It's coming across this boat. Now, um, if, you, if you look at the other picture I'm gonna show you, the, this next picture is actually of the jangada. This is a, a picture that my parents purchased when we were in Brazil, um, an oil painting picture. 
but the sail is bigger than the entire boat. And these boards are just straight boards that go out and they go, they go way, way out in the water because it's flat and the, 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 the water comes across these boards um, because it's flat and the wood is so light. I was always concerned that it would sink. This wood is so light that it doesn't sink. The wood will not sink. And as Jagata actually, you know, it looks like some castaway hurriedly put it together. And, and, and however, don't be fooled because they stay at sea for several days and they can be found alongside ocean liners up to 50, 40 to 50 miles offshore. So to get on one of these, it had to take a lot of faith not to be afraid, not to go out so far. Nowadays, the commercial fishing boats have replaced the jangada. You know, but there's even a song about the jangaderos, and these are the fishermen, and it's called Mia Jangada Vasei Pumar, and it's a beautiful song. You can, you can Google it, but it talks about the fishermen that are going out to sea, and hopefully his compañeros will come back. But there, there were a lot of fishermen that were lost at sea on these crafts because there were no guards anywhere, and you could fall right in. You had to be very experienced, you had to be fearless, and you had to be full of faith to be this kind of fisherman. Now the disciples, of the five that we know their prof professions, the majority of the disciples of those five were fishermen, and we know that, and they're on this boat, and they too are used to this boat. This is a boat they use every day to go out and fish, and this great windstorm comes up. And I figure this has to be really a horrendous windstorm for these experienced fishermen to be scared to death, scared that they're going to perish. And they basically were fearing for their lives. They didn't know what to do. And they noticed Jesus over here sleeping like a baby. Nothing's bothering him. And they're going up and down. I can just imagine. And they're so scared, believing that they're going to perish, that they wake Jesus up. Jesus immediately rebukes the storm and calms the sea. And then he rebukes the disciples. Now, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever woken somebody up from a deep sleep? I mean, I have, and it's, it's horrific, especially if they're in REM sleep. You wake them up and they're ready to kick. So I can, when Jesus rebukes the disciples, I think it's for, part of it's for waking him up from such a good sleep. But the other part of it is he says, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? Ouch. I can just hear one of the disciples going, man, we should not have woken him up. But I sure am glad that he calmed the sea. And then, and then they're filled with great awe. And they said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is like a light goes off for the disciples, right? Poof, they know now who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. And once the disciples realized that Jesus was with them, the storm became calm. Once they knew the presence of Jesus was there, a fearless peace entered their hearts. To voyage with the presence of Jesus was to voyage in peace, even in a storm. And this was just... This was not just a one-time crossing. This is something that still happens and it can happen for us. Even in the wildest storms of life with the presence of Jesus, we can have peace. And it seems to me that over these last 16 months, we've had to deal with some really very dramatic storms. Jesus gives us peace in, in the storm of sorrow. Jesus reminds us when sorrow comes our way, and it will, he reminds us of the glory of the life to come. Jesus changes the darkness of death to the brightness of eternal life. He shares with us the love of God. And he assures us also that those who have died that we love have gone to God. And he gives us the knowledge that we will meet again those whom we have loved and lost only for a while. 
Jesus gives us peace during the turbulent times that we are distraught, that we are doubtful, and yes, even depressed over life's problems, not knowing which road to take for sure or just how to move forward. When we turn it all over to Jesus, he will make the road clear for us. The path will be made known. But we must be willing to do his will and humbly submit. Thy will be done. That is the way to peace during such a stormy time. And Jesus gives us peace in the storms of apprehension, fear, and worry. We are anxious, perhaps even over anxious about ourselves, the unknown future, and about those we love. But Jesus speaks to us of a love beyond which neither we nor those we love can ever drift. In the storm of anxiety, he brings us the peace of the love of God. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Remember this, Jesus had all the power in heaven and on earth available to him. But he chose to empty himself of his power and to take the life of an average person. He chose to endure hardship. He chose to endure oppression from the Roman government and rejection from religious establishments and even his own family. He chose to be hungry, to be lonely, to be abandoned and betrayed by his closest friends. He chose to suffer wrongful arrest and torture and humiliation and death. Jesus chose to place himself into every imaginable storm because he had faith that God was using these storms for a greater purpose, for the salvation of the world. Jesus chose a place himself into every imaginable storm because he knew God Almighty was with him every step of the way. And that's how he could face down every storm without fear. There is no storm we cannot weather without Jesus in our boat. Sometimes he calms the storm and sometimes he calms us in the midst of the storm. And from the Gospel of John, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And it's our job to pass that on. Amen.